Hi folks, welcome to iDrum and today we're in London. In fact, we're in the heart of London. We are at the very legendary Ronnie Scott's Club and I'm delighted to say that I'm joined by a drummer that, that had a very big effect upon me when I was, was younger, when equally when he was younger too. And I'm joined yeah. by none other than Mr. Greg Rico. Greg, welcome Pleasure to the UK. To meet you. Likewise, thank you, you so much. Thank you for your time. Mm -hmm. Now, for you the people that maybe have been living in a cave, um, Greg was a drummer with Sly and the Family Stone, and he's currently here in London playing at Ronnie Scott's, doing uh, four shows, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Well, two tonight. Yeah, with yeah. Three, three shows actually. But oh, three shows. Okay, one's yeah. close enough. Right, we, with the Family Stone, That's right. which includes yourself as an original member, obviously um, Jerry Martini, Jerry Martini, and Cynthia Robinson. And Cynthia Robinson. Fantastic. Yeah. So, w what was the idea with 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 putting the Family Stone kind of together? We just, you know, got hit by the spirit to go out and do the music again. I know I did mm -hmm. and um, you know it was, it was encouraged by a couple promoters that had called me uh, over the last this last decade. And that kind of started it. It was a promoter in San Francisco that called and said why don't you put something together you know related to the music that you came from you know back in the day. So I had called Cynthia and Jerry and we you know we did this was a, I think it was the San Francisco Funk Festival or something. Right. And anyway, from that, then some other things happened, like uh, you know the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction and things that kind of you know inspired us and with the ad, with the internet and all that and the, and the messages you get from people, from the public, from fans that are uh, telling you that you know how uplifting and the music was to them and they they were inspired, maybe right. guys that started their careers because of it and what have you, so. Uh, you know, it felt good, and and, and um, when we got together and played a little bit, it it, 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 it was still there. Right. And um, so we got into it, and it's been wonderful. It's been, I mean, we go around the world. Uh, like we were in Australia about two, three years ago, and we did a series of big festivals. Right. Big festivals, hundred fifty thousand people. There. Nice. So you got all the generations there, and there's young kids that are four, five, six generations removed from when we did yeah. the music. <laughs> yeah. And they, I, that moment of playing on stage and looking at the people, I mean, that could have been 1968. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. And here it's 2000 something. Yeah, yeah 2014. So it was just, it's just amazing. Of course, Sly was a prolific songwriter and, you know, yeah. the music that he wrote. And, it just keeps coming back. Well, he he was visionary. I mean, that band was visionary. Yeah. You know, let's. I mean, and and you and you talk about him being prolific. I think in in '68 alone, you released two records. The first yeah. record in '67 was a whole new thing, which right. was the most appropriately titled record yeah. I could That's what it was. ever think of. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and then, of course, in '68 and '69, you did Dance to the Music and Life. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, he. How did you? Because I mean, you guys were busy playing out as well, weren't you? You well, weren't like in like when we do did a whole new thing. We were playing in Vegas at the time. We we there's a place called the Pussy Catagogo. You know, that's just like when we had just left San Francisco. Right. So uh, we did six nights a week, eight p.m. to six a.m. Oh, 20, 30 minute sets, and then the same off all night long. Wow. So we were working hard. On our off night, on Monday night, we'd fly or drive to Los Angeles and record at CBS Studios on Sunset. And that's where we did Home of the first right, record. Right. So we, we were hitting it heavy. You, you know? were. But I mean, uh, you know, the energy, everything was there. You know, I mean, it was just, it was just, that was our our daily experience. Yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, it was, we were living it. Yeah, you know? yeah. So yeah, other than being a little tired once in a while. Effortless. I just want to jump back a little bit before that, if I can, Greg. I yeah. mean, what were you doing before Sly? I mean, you, you were obviously busy in 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 the, in the Bay Area or whatever. I mean, what what were you doing well, at that time? Actually, when we started the group, that was the suburb of 1966. I was 17 and a half. Wow. I started playing when I was 14. Right. And so I wasn't doing a whole lot except for Freddie and I had a band. Freddie, Sly's brother. Yeah, yeah. He was in the group. It, singer and guitar player. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a band the prior year and before that I was just paying, playing in beer joints and stuff. Right, with, right. With guys that, you know, I had met in the neighborhood and that's how it started. So I, I was in the right place at the right time as far as, you know, getting into it and just 
rolling right on. Sure, to yeah, yeah. Things to do. Enjoying the journey. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, it obviously, playing with Freddie because then you know the, the the brotherly hookup was was yeah was kind of almost in place. And and did it take did it how did everybody else kind of come into the band? Was that a, a slow process or were you no no actually when we started the band on that day I spoke of. Mm -hmm. Uh, I had gone to a rehearsal. I showed up for a rehearsal with mm -hmm. for the fr band that Freddie and I had, which was called the Stone Souls. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, when I got to the house, uh, you know, none of the guys from the band were there. And I asked uh, Sly and Freddie were in the room having something to eat. And I said, "Where's Where's all the guys?" And he said, "We're going to start something new tonight." But let me back up a little bit. Sly had made a couple attempts at putting bands together that right. he wasn't happy with. They were crowd, so he had consciously thought about I'm going to handpick and put something together and really make it different. I mean, mm -hmm. he, this was a conscious effort on his part. So he had assembled uh, everybody that you know that's in the band. That night was the first time we met. Wow! And we didn't even play that night. We talked about what we were going to do. Right. And, Excellent. And you know, just discussed everything and talked about it. Just. All, uh, we, we were all kind of like in awe of each other, just the fact that, well, this is really going to be different. You know, you had <laughs> you know, black, white, male, female, yeah. and, and all this mix of life. Yeah. And to make a musical in, uh, unit, uh, this got to be different. You, you could Absolutely. feel it. You could feel it was going to be different. And Sly had a radio show at, that was very successful at that time. Right. So he already was a personality, and, you know. Yeah. He was a record producer, mm -hmm. and he had a couple of you know, some success going uh, with that. So you knew that this was going to be, well, this has got some serious possibilities. You Excellent. Know? There's a lot of elements that are in place that right. really happen. And, you know, we rehearsed for that next week and started playing the following week. Fantastic. A place called Winchester Cathedral. Right. Which the guy that owned it was our first manager. Oh, okay, uh, right. Richard Manella was his name. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was before Bill Graham kind of came was before, yeah. Well, he, no, Bill was around then. Oh, okay, yeah, because he was running like the film. He had the film more. Yeah, matter of yeah. fact, uh, Rich tried to get us in there at, at you know, after a, a while, we started getting the little presents, and, mm -hmm. and he said, well, this would really work in here, and Bill turned it down. Oh, really? And, and, and <laughs> yeah, and uh, uh, Bill told Rich that was, uh, oh, it was something like, you know, it's, it's, it's not a dance hall or something like that. And well, but you make a long story short, about a year later, he paid dearly for it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we enjoyed it. The, the film was great in Winterland. Sure, yeah. We did that with uh, Winterland, I think, with Led Zeppelin once. And, right. Uh, it was a wonderful place. Wow, the what a East. Bill. Fillmore so East was another yeah, yeah. Uh, fantastic venue that was built. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a matter of fact, um, I got a call recently from Sony, and they're putting out a. Uh, it was a to a three-day run at the Fillmore East that was recorded on multi-track, and it's a live, it's come out as a live album, I think October. Oh, wow. Yeah. Right, right, okay. Yeah. Oh, oh, I look forward to that. And what year was that recorded in? It was 68. 68? Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. So they were kind of like lost tapes, and then suddenly they re-emerged? No, or I, you I've, had them. I've had them. Oh. I've had copies of the shows for years, and they've showed up in bootleg, and they've showed up at every which way. Right. For some reason, they just, you know, stocked it away in their vaults. And and I've heard over the years of rumors that it was going to come out. But anyway, yeah, yeah. again, long story short, it's coming out for sure. Excellent. I got, got a call from a and Nice. Okay, well, yeah. I'm going to go camp outside and, and their there's, office. There's some <laughs> just... Um, there's some, we were at the top of our game yeah, right yeah, at that yeah. point, and there's some fantastic uh, performances on there. I can imagine, because I, mean, I, mean, I mean, the band, I mean, even the records, there's an element of live kind of playing to, yeah. to the records, but the live show must have been, f from your point of view, must have been full on yeah. from, from the moment, the, you know, the curtain came up. Well, we, we, we had that ability to, you know, to make records, yeah, yeah, and, and then uh, also to perform live, and it's it's a different set of chops, you know. It's a different approach, and right. sometimes you got to uh, embrace closely what you did on a record and and, and recreate that verbatim. Sometimes you got to let it go. Yeah, and yeah. There's something different with it, mm -hmm. and you know, we found ourselves going through that process of, of searching when we, each song, right. what it required. You know, we already did the record, obviously, but sure, uh, yeah. as a in a live performance, you know. 
Okay. And uh, so that, that I think that was one of the elements that made the band such a powerful live performing band. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, because I mean, the other thing is, I mean, the footage I've seen and, and images, um, I mean, you were always sort of perched up on some great right, big right. riser. It looked like you had no <laughs> monitoring, no, like, no monitors or anything. And I mean, you were almost placed in like the worst possible place you could have well, been. Well, you know, those were the days uh, right. you, you didn't have live sound reinforcement no, production no. like you do now. Yeah, sure. It was left a lot to be mm -hmm. desired. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, um, when we signed to Columbia, they owned Fender at the time, right? So we all had got you know Fender amps. I had two uh, Dual Showmans just for my bass drum. I had a right. Shure 54 <laughs> on the bass drum, and you know that was my that was <laughs> your monitoring <laughs> system to make the stage. Big. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so you know that's how it was. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. But it, I, I guess I suppose yeah, because if you have if you haven't got the on stage sound coming from the monitors, there's a balance there to some extent anyway. Yeah. You know. I mean, but I mean, were, you, were there times when you were struggling to hear what Larry was playing or whatever, just looking for somebody's foot? Oh, or no, whatever. I could hear Larry. Jeez, he had like <laughs> four, four dual showmen. Sly had six for, for in his Leslies, and I mean. Right. We could hear the stage, but uh, but you know you couldn't hear the vocals. No, this, you know, because that was going straight out yeah. the front. Yeah. But I mean, li me and Larry were locked tight, you know, and uh, we had a great chemistry anyway. Uh, but you know, you just dealt with it. You didn't know any better. No, no. I, mean, I, guess I never that. had you know in ear monitors sure. or the mm. perfect you know subwoofer and. Yeah. 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 You know, no. Nice we, big speakers and back. We created all those problems later. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And <laughs> they're in the, that's true too. So yeah, yeah. when that came along it brought other problems. But uh, you got a good production team and you know, guys that know how to mix and stuff. There ain't nothing better, you know, when it gets that sweet that sweet spot, you know, it sounds big and everything's there, you know. It's like a freight train. <laughs> 